if I go back to a younger, pre 10 year old Colette, who do I see? I was very shy. I didn't have the words for leadership, but I was like, I'm a big sister and I like that. I went to a state junior school in Luton and then I got a scholarship to go to a private school in Bedford. When I started school, I was bullied by a group of girls, quite horrendous girls. The problem is, if you're quiet like this, people will just think they can pick on you. I never seen as creative, never saw myself as creative. And then I got to advertising and it's really odd like saying this because I say it to people now and they're like, what, you weren't allowed? But literally I was at an agency and I wanted to move into strategy and they just wouldn't allow it. And every agency I went to, they were like, no, you, have to stay. you can't be a strategist. But the industry, was deeply racist and for me it's like you've gone through the lemonade era of smashing down barriers and they're still going to do that but actually you're going to do it in a way that's beautifully sparkly and creative and it's not for everybody running a business but it certainly worked for me you took your own savings and you backed yourself every single thing that you said makes perfect sense so how do organizations and cultures then begin to actually make a change because... if you've got a diversity equity inclusion strategy it's likely that you've started collecting data on who is in your organization and their experiences there's a whole lot of brilliant work that's been done looking at the role of organizational structure how do you define leadership welcome to another episode of everyday leadership today i have someone who is out there in the world challenging pushing the boundaries and someone who's also got the receipts to be able to actually do so um i came across our guest at um a friend a mutual friend dave mcqueen's um what should i call it now conference <laughs> in 2023 and I loved her talk. I'm not even going to go into what the talk was about. We're going to talk about the podcast for sure. But I loved her talk. I loved her fire. I loved her, her way of looking at things. And I was like, you know what? I, I need to talk to I need to talk to this person and find a bit more about them. So I invited her. She said yes. And today I have the pleasure of talking to Colette Phillip. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? How are you landing today? How are you landing in this podcast right now? You know what? I'm landing in this podcast in, yeah, in a pretty good way, actually. I feel good. Yeah, I feel I'm excited. I'm excited for the conversation. I am, I am glad to hear it. And generally speaking, there are only ever two questions I ask in every single podcast. Everything else is always unscripted. And for you, I am very curious to learn... If I go back to a younger, pre 10 year old Colette, who do I see? Who is that young individual, that curious individual at that point in time in your life? So pre 10 years old, I uh, was, okay. So uh, there's some things that are very similar to who I am now. Um, so I wore glasses, they, were different glasses to now, national health kind of sort of clear plastic ones. Um, I uh, was I was very shy. That's very. I was very painfully shy, almost with people I didn't know or didn't trust. Not with everybody, with my family. So it often appeared when people would meet me or see me, like I it could be two different people, um, and because um, with my family. I was, you know, had energy and was like, I, I like to laugh and I like to have fun. Um, and that's the side of people, pe that's a side that people who knew me and who I liked would see. Or I'd be super quiet, just super quiet, wouldn't want to say anything, wouldn't want to like draw attention to myself in any way. Um, so that was, that was me at 10. Uh, what's what, an, another thing about me at 10? Oh, okay, so I was living in Luton, which is where I grew up. Um, and I, with my mum and dad and my brother, um, I now, <laughs> 10, 10 year old me, I had just one brother. I now have a sister and another brother. Um, but 10 year old me didn't have them yet. Um, and I was... Um, what else can I say about 10? Oh, do you know what? 10-year-old me also, pre-10-year-old me, wanted to be Prime Minister. I was super clear on it. 
absolutely really wanted to run the country. That is what I always do for my job when I grow up. When people ask me, I was super clear, like like nothing. Else. And that actually was something that whether it was shy Colette or kind of more outgoing, friendly, happy Colette, um, I was completely consistent in wanting to be prime minister. Um, so I got very Hi. different reactions depending on who knew me. Why prime minister? What was it about being a prime minister that that drove you? Um, so I really remember it. Like my my little brother asked me the question, and we, I might have been, I think I was like six. He was about four, and he said to me, "Oh, so what do you want to be when you grow up?" And I think, and I was like, um, "I," and and I, and I think he, I thought about it for a bit, and then I said to him, "What do you want to be?" And I was like, and he. He said like five or six different things. Fireman, footballer, this, like a whole list of different things. And I thought about it and I thought, okay, um, I really want to help people. And I am, I, I, I didn't have the words for leadership, but I was like, I'm a big sister and I like that. Like I like that. And I, I knew there was something in it. But also I saw, I would, I'd see... I forgot what her name is, but there was a, a barrister on TV quite a lot at that time in the 80s. It was a barrister, a black female barrister. And there was also Diane Abbott, two black women I saw. And at the time, Margaret Thatcher was um, prime minister. And I always remember thinking, mm, OK, female prime minister, fine. Black women, even better. So I thought, good. I didn't think I'd be the first, but I definitely wanted to be prime minister. I thought, yes, because that's the way you're going to help the most people. So you wanted to help people at that point in time. There was, there was something inside of you there that, that was already inkling. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So when did yeah. you move from being outwardly shy to family mem other than family members? When, when did that change begin to happen for you? Yeah. Um, I, it happened at secondary school. And I think it was... I start, it happened throughout secondary school started in my first year of secondary school so what's that now like year seven and but and I went to so I I went to a state junior school in Luton just like and I, and then I got a scholarship to go to a private school in Bedford and I was suddenly around very different people and than I was used to and it was an all girls school as well uh, which honestly it's gonna go a different way I love that I'm a st- I'm such a I, I really love the company of women and I really love the fact it's a girls school and I think I did better because of it but um I was when I started school I was bullied by a group of girls quite horrendous girls bullied quite a lot and I remember one day they were being so it's just ridiculous they were I had a book and I was reading a book and they took it off me and were throwing it between themselves and I suddenly got I suddenly thought nah you need to the problem is, if you're quiet like this, people will just think they can pick on you. But you're from Luton. These girls don't know who they're dealing with. And I genuinely <laughs> remember thinking it, like leaning in. I was like, you're from Luton. You know, people don't. And I remember thinking these girls don't know. And I was like, and I thought about it. And then I just went up. And, and this, this is very me. And it's a very me thing to do, which is that I thought about it. And then I just thought, no. Nah. And I went and just lamped one of the girls in the face. I don't condone violence, but it was very effective. No one messed with me again. And then I wasn't really shy anymore. Um, and then the next year I made loads of, I made a, a really close group of school friends. There's like eight of us. We're still friends to this day. And then I wasn't really shy anymore. And I realised that. And I, and I think it was that realisation that you've got to find your voice so you don't get picked on. And I, it was the first time I'd really associated those two things. But also the thing I say is very me is that I tend to, I, I've got, I have this fire and I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't have um, a massive temper or anything. I don't really, I, I, I don't, but I do have a fire. And when it's, um, when it's lit, it burns very hot and it burns somewhat predi- unpredictably, like we won't know the result. So I, it can be like that, like I'll just lose it. And so, and it now I I sort of my, it's different now because I don't I don't tend to go around losing it not often but but I do in a sense because that's what my fire around tackling injustice is it's the same thing so when people ask you like how can you how can you do that how can you go into rooms of clients and just say the words white supremacy and not flinch and I'm like because 
like I need to because they need to know. It's like it's that same fire. It just it pushes me, and every time, and then there's also me to go. I'm just not going to allow this to happen, and think no. Nah. And it gets to a point. So, and it was a, a point where I'm like. Either sometimes I don't notice something or I won't know and then I'm suddenly like, no, enough is enough and then the fire hits and then I move and the results, <laughs> for, to me, are very unpredictable. Um, to the outside world and everyone else I know, that's me and, and our mutual friend David McQueen, he's like, the results are entirely predictable. You are going to make something happen. That's what happens. Something You will make something happen because when that fire hits... Um, you'll make something happen. He didn't say those exact words, but he said words to that effect. And I'm always like, it's bit unpredictable. It isn't really, because something will happen. That fire is effectively an awakening, awakening of something inside of you that says to that young girl, I'm not going to have this hand to push back or to corporate organisations. I'm not going to have this in this environment. We need to do something about your organisation, your culture, your communication, all that bits and pieces. But it's an awakening and to make change and to move the dial and to do something different. Mm. Exactly. It's interesting how you can think about how something like that happening to you from a young age and how that spark being lit has had such a massive impact on so many things all the way throughout your, your career. It's, I did, I was at a, um, a, a leadership conference of, and many, many years ago now, I was going to say a few years, it feels like a few years, but in reality it was like 2014, so like a decade ago now. Um, and uh, there was a coach on stage and it was about women's leadership and she got us to think about it. She got us to think back to early experiences and I hadn't really thought about it, but I thought, no, that is where, because they, because it, and, and, they, and um, yeah, and then from there, I thought about it then, and then it sort of sat with me. So when I was having coaching much later, I came back to it, and the coach therefore then just pushed and said, "No, there's there's got to be a there's there's got to be not one moment. When was the moment? What changed? Exactly as you've just done. Ask questions. So what changed? What changed? Um, and I thought about it. I thought, no, this is it. And then I verified it because obviously our memories, our memories. I verified it with my mum and dad, and they were like, "No, that's exactly what happened." Because I needed to be sure that it wasn't just me, you know, uh, rewriting history to suit myself. So I was like, let me go and talk to my mum and dad about it. And they'd be very open with it. They'd be like, no, we do not remember that. But they were like, no, that's pretty much. They they under, they, they verified it. Not everything, because a lot of it happened in my head. But they were like, yes, that's when we saw the change in you. Yes, that's when, that's when we saw the change in you. We thought that maybe that school had given you confidence. Now we understand the full picture. They sort of loved it, to be honest. So were you... Uh very academic student for you to get the scholarship to go from moving to that school yeah I wasn't uh, made to think so but yes I I now I definitely was I yeah I definitely was I was super academic like I it's funny like when you go to a school like that everybody is everyone's really smart and so you you don't necessarily realize it and also I will say and and it will resonate probably with many black women, black people, that people at that school, they were really, sh when I got my GCSE results and they were good, they were shocked because they didn't expect it of me. Now, I expected it of me because I thought, no, I, there was only a few things I thought, no, I've got this and I'm, I'm really good. I, I, I read really well. Like I, I read really quickly. I've got them. I, just, I knew it. I've got a good memory. This ain't hard to me, but they were shocked. And, um, and I, and I, I know it was the first time I'd really seen that. And I just noted it. And often I see the same thing where people will underestimate you. So, um, yeah, I was very academic, um, in a very academic school. I was very academic. I wasn't ever like, you know, top of the class, the one getting all A's. I wasn't really, I just sort of flew under the radar, kind of middle of the class, did all right, mostly. Um, and then smashed it in my results. And that's sort of how I operate kind of. So where did the the love for creativity, where, where was that birth for you to go into what you've done over the last, what, 20 plus years working at some of the world's biggest um, ad agencies and, and leading like brand teams and digital teams? That was, it's really interesting, isn't it? That was, and I really love the question because I haven't thought about it. Um, that was... Uh, so at university, I did, this is not going to sound creative when it starts, but I did international management in German because I always liked languages. I loved languages, 
but I didn't when I went to university when I went to look around unis you know as you did and I I sort of went to look around unis and I suddenly I I realized that I put I didn't really I do this quite often I didn't really think about it I was like I like languages so let me just do all modern languages and only after I you know the, I forgot the process but the UCAS form there's a, there comes a point where your choices are kind of set and you can only do those universities and it's quite hard to do differently after that point was when I went to see the universities for the first time, not before I'd made the choices. So, of course, I chose them all on brochures and course, just purely theoretically. Went to these open days and realised I definitely didn't want to do modern languages. Definitely didn't want to. Except, like, if you have ten choices, eight of them were modern languages. And I was like, uh, okay, well... <laughs> I bet I like the other two choices I've chosen, which were both international business with German or international business and modern languages. And that's what I ended up doing at uni. Luckily, I did actually really enjoy it. And we at uni, then we did market. It's the first time I, came, I did marketing and came across it. And it's a bit, I have the same relationship with marketing now. Like, I love bits of the discipline. There are bits I'm like, well, this is really boring. It's not for me. And the bits I liked were around brand and advertising and creativity. And I loved all that creative, creative bits. Again, interestingly, creative was not an adjective that was ever appended to me. Never, ever. So even though I do super creative projects, like we, I come up with ideas. And I remember doing this group project and I was like, we should, a group project. And we had to do an a group activity and then we had to do a presentation on that activity and our activity uh i got overruled in the group and i we end up doing something really 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 bad and boring and i was like and we didn't get a very good re result but on the presentation they were like actually the presentation 50 percent of your break rates i was like we can smash it if we if we do really well the presentation so i'm like we should do it as, what did I say? We should do it as a court case. Should we present our work like it's a court case? With And we got like, I think in the, in the, the thing, the activity, we got like, I don't know, like 50% or something. And in oh. the, the presentation, we got 85%. And I was like, that was my idea. And it was the first time I've got ideas. And I had loads of ideas. I've always had loads of ideas, but I never really creative. I'd never seen as creative. I never saw myself as creative. And then I got to advertising and... I really love creativity, but as an, I was always on the periphery of it. So I was an account handler. I wasn't, um, it's really odd like saying this, but you, cause I say it to people now and they're like, what you weren't allowed, but literally I was at an agency and I wanted to move in strategy and they just wouldn't allow it. And every agency I went to, they were like, no, you have to stay, you can't be a strategist. And I was like, why? But I'm doing strategy. Um, because at the time, I, I genuinely think black women weren't strategists, so it's just that. And and I and I and I verified this with a friend of mine, um, with a few friends of mine, and there were very few agencies where strategy was see it. They uh, advertising. I mean, it still is. Um, they want to say it's getting better, and I'm like, it, yes, some, and then other things haven't changed. But the industry was deeply racist and they really had a very... It, if you were a black person getting into the industry, you were expected just to be grateful for that and give get what you're... You know, do what you're given and nothing more. And don't ask for anything more. Definitely don't have any agency over your career. No, you just need to do what we say. And make sure you... You know that thing where they say work twice as hard to get in the same place? And people say, oh, my parents told me. My mum and dad never told me that. It's a terrible thing to say to people. My mum and dad never said that. I learned it the hard way in advertising because I was genuinely expected to work twice as hard. So, um, but despite all that, despite not having the roles, I really love ideas and I really loved the creative process and I really love shoots and I love productions and I really enjoyed, I really like working with brand folks and clients and I liked all the creative bits. I like, but I like insight. I liked talking to consumers like and listening to I liked all of it and I, and I like that creative process was where it started from just like the love of brands and that's it came from my career in advertising so that I'm really I'm just yeah I, I feel very um yeah I feel gratitude for it not grateful to the industry but I feel gratitude for the opportunity um if that makes sense because I I that's where it it, it despite even as an account handler and then you know 
in the very latter stages of my career, I did strategy for a short while. Um, I've been able to, I was, it, it opened my eyes to a very different way of thinking and being and a set of skills that I, that deliver really great outcomes for brands and change the way that people think and change the way that people perceive stuff. And I just wouldn't have had any idea that existed before going into advertising. Um, oh, and, and, and so from marketing to advertising, I did a marketing year, a year abroad in Germany doing a marketing role. I mean, admittedly it was a paper, paper factory. So I don't think I give marketing a, a good go, but I didn't like it. So I was like, no, I don't want to do it. And then someone suggested to me, what about advertising? Cause it's a bit like marketing, but you might like it. And I was like, great. So I just went and did it and applied to all the agencies in London, like literally this paper list. And I applied to all of them. Some sent me grad application forms back. Some didn't, I filled them all in. Uh, and I got one interview and then I got one second interview and then I got the job. And so that's how it works. And, and, you know, and then I didn't, you know, it was, and it's, yeah, I, I really, it's, I have a really love hate relationship with the whole industry, but the one thing I, I absolutely love is just the understanding of creativity and how it can drive impact that that gave me. How is it possible for you to keep that creative gene going when you are also navigating knocking at doors and being told no being one of the few black women in the industry that effectively didn't necessarily want you or kind of try to box you in because i know creativity requires a lot of energy and mental space to, to really tap into that and you're navigating that and navigating the emotional system around you how do you keep how do you hold those two things? It's not balance, but I'm going to use the word balance. How did you manage to navigate those two things? Um, I do, in in reality, I didn't. So, um, I didn't definitely didn't balance them at all and didn't navigate it. I think the pressure of doing that caused me to burn out on more than one occasion. One in one occasion in my advertising career, so badly I just left the industry altogether. Um, and I and I and I so I think that that one the second thing is I don't think I ever allowed myself to see myself as creative that came much left later and that's only really come through brand by me in the industry I would have said no 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 you know I I, I, I would have said that I would have said I worked with creatives and I would have said I work well with creatives and there's an element of truth that I wouldn't have said I am creative I'd have said I work really well with creatives and I work well with creatives to xyz that's what I would have said and that's how to solve for myself so I think there was a distance between myself and I put that distance in quite deliberately. But, and then the other thing is, I guess, because sometimes, sometimes you, what you're talking about is like, then there is an element of creativity in all our roles. When you work in the industry, you have to be able to understand that you've got to be, at, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I can't say, I can't speak for everybody. Maybe some people cannot do this. I don't quite understand how you can kind of represent work to clients or, you know, show up for the brands that you're working on if you don't understand ideas or you can't have a conversation about ideas or you can't protect the core of an idea but understand also that it needs to work for the client and the business and hold that that sort of tension. And I don't understand how you cannot be creative and do that. So, um, but I didn't call myself creative. So that's a way of, I guess, coping. But I think the other thing is I'm, I am optimistic and it's really interesting for ages, they would, particularly in that industry, they paint me as pessimistic, but I'm incredibly optimistic. And I think that that helps. And I've always done creative stuff. Like I, growing up, I um, studied, the uh, studied uh, ish. I played piano till grade. I think I just, I just gave up just before doing my grade seven or whatever. So I got, I, did, I can play piano. I, I mean, now not well, but it has been, I don't know what, 30 years or something. Um, more of that. No, no, not quite 30 years, but thereabouts 27 years or something. Um, so, but, and I, and I sort of moved away from music because I found it, it's too, it was too much doing that and also trying to do the career and work and it was too much, like piano takes work and I couldn't do it. 
But I did like to dance. I used to do dance classes all the time. I'd go to Pineapple Studios. I'd go all over London. I was I did Bollywood dance for a few years. I did. I used to really love dancing. And that having a creative outlet is something I had hadn't really grasped how important it is. And I really lost sight of it when I started Brand by Me for a number of years. Obviously, I didn't. I stopped because I wasn't going into London anymore as often. I, don't, I live outside London now, so I wasn't going to London. So I was like, I stopped my dance classes and then. And it took me a while to recapture that. And I think having some a creative discipline that you can just do for fun and that you love is a, re- is a really good way of also capturing that too. Because then you it, 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 it helps you see the world a different way and use a different part of your brain. And I don't know, maybe it just... I think it unlocks something. Or it may, maybe it unlocks something, it keeps something... Keeps you topped up, all that sort of good stuff. I, think, I believe so. I think it's the the outlet is so key. I think I, I do a lot of work in IT. I remember someone listened to someone talk about a time ago, and they said they always tell engineers in your downtime do something completely different to to code it, um, just to tap into a completely different side of your brain. And research has shown that when they do that and they come back to their work. The way that they are able to like, pull different codes and create stuff is so much better and quicker and a lot more innovative because you're you just looked in the same thing over and over and over again you don't learn much but if you do something slightly different you have that channel that outlet it's really really great so i can definitely see why you would able to have that was really really good for you and you felt the impact when you didn't do it um your normal day-to-day routine as well mm. Yeah. And it's really interesting when you ask that thing about creativity. So we probably will come on and talk about this, but Brand By Me did our first ever advertising campaign. Like literally there were billboards across the UK and like bus sort of, six, they're called six sheets, right? Sort of the posters, bus, bus posts, roadside posters with our ads on them for the first time ever last October. And I was co-creative director. I did it with our creative, the creative director of Brand By Me. Me and him worked on it together. We did the campaign. We had the credits. And one of my friends was saying to me the other day, she said, you never, ever, you just didn't ever talk about yourself. Even if you did a campaign as creative director, you've never done that. You didn't do anything with it. You didn't, not you didn't do anything with the campaign. We've done loads with it. But she said, you didn't do anything with you around that side of you. You didn't talk about how you, you didn't go out and do like a big, you didn't talk about how you developed the idea together or anything you didn't, beyond like one LinkedIn post. You didn't really lean into the creative side. And she said, and, and you know, as a female creative director that you are now, and I was like, oh, I'm not really, I'm a strategist. And she was like, no, you, how can you possibly, you've done an ad, you, you're a creative director. And I was like, but, and she said, and she was questioning me, like really challenging me, why you didn't lean into it. And I think it comes from the same thing. Like when you asked me the question about capturing and, and, and holding on to creativity, I was like, it still takes me a beat to think of myself as a creative. It still does. All these years later, oh, despite having a business that's in the business of creativity, despite winning awards, we literally won the Precious Award for Creative Business of the Year. And it still would not be my go-to adjective to describe myself or like my role at all, which is interesting. I think for me, it's a very good example of when we talk about that systematic racism this is what the system does it it beats something in into you and because either directly or indirectly because you're in it for so long there's a part of you that gets indoctrinated into that way of thinking and that unlearning and relearning that needs to happen is not easy and there are times when you know if you step out of it, you're doing it like I am. I am creative. We won awards. We we do this, but for you internally to be able to own it, but like I am a creative person, it's probably one of the hardest things to be able to do because that's a it's a necessary but hard step for people to take. And there are times when people be like, yeah, but I don't get it. Just say the words. I don't know. You weren't in it for twenty years. <laughs> you you weren't going through what I was going through. That's a very long time to be able to just snap out of it. But it sounds like you're you're trying. And at least you're aware of it, which is a good thing. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's it, isn't it? It's it's really, yeah. What you, you you've just said it. It's really powerful, and 
it's it's one of those things we talk about it a lot uh, from I mean, we, we talk about unlearning right and there's so many things you have to unlearn and it's constant and it's sometimes it's hard and it's sometimes deeply painful or even you know it, even traumatic for people i mean i'm not saying it's, this is not traumatic for me to be honest the creative thing but it is hard and it is a barrier that i have to consistently not allow myself to allow me to get in the way of myself or way of my business by doing because it will stop me from for example going for opportunities or you know you see a grant that says creative businesses and I have to take a minute to think are we and I shouldn't be taking a minute to think are we I should be just going for it you know that sort of thing and so but it's it's just that it, it's once you're you're aware of it you just have to keep keep going and and just make it you know present you're and wrong. tangible to yourself so when I hear myself not creative you think no you interrupt yourself there then no Colette yes yes you guess creative and therefore yes do this it's like, a, you know, the habitual thought and often things are shrugged off as like implicit or unconscious or deeply ingrained. And they are. But those things are also used as excuses why things happen without necessarily taking accountability for the change. So I go, actually, if, if this is an example for me of going, no, I have to make it real, make it present make it front and centre, and when I hear it, I need to probably, if I hear myself going, mm, not creative, I probably need to run in that exact direction that that little voice is trying to pull me away from, because it's probably what I need to be doing. Well, you said your work for 2024 is transformed, so this is another transformation that's... <laughs> it's also happening, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. It is so... It's true, though, and I was super deliberate about it, because I've just... The, the, the thing that comes to my mind all the time is Beyonce because I think she is uh, the queen bee and queen of transformation though. It's not about like not world domination, definitely not about, you know, billionaire and capitalism and all that sort of thing. I'm not here for that as <laughs> wouldn't be me. It's not my business, but it is about that. Just the way that the transformation and rent that was at the heart of Renaissance and it just is that for me like now you've gone through kind of the lemon for me it's like you've gone through the lemonade era of smashing down barriers and it's still going to do that but actually you're going to do it in a way that's beautifully sparkly and creative and you're like and literally in her like renaissance film she was like i feel like she was like um am i allowed to swear on this probably not yeah so she's like, I just, you know, I've got to the stage. She says, I'm now in my 40s and I've learned just not to give a fuck. And I'm like, that's 100% my energy. That's that's why I want it transformed. That's exactly what I want for this year. I want to be in this creative, not, you know, smashing down marriage, but more, not the, with the, the bat of lemonade, but like this creative, amazing, just things from me. That's what I want to be in this huge creative era. And those things are then going to dismantle rather than me having to be there with the bat doing it myself. Do you know what I mean? And that's the energy. That's the energy of transformation that I want to be in. And it has to be bold and sparkly and amazing. And just, that's what I want. And, and you know, and me, like my friend, um, Chloe keeps going to me, you just need to keep, I, I want to see you shining. And she keeps saying, maybe not those exact words. I'm pretty sure she has those, said those exact words. And she's like, I want to see you shining. I want to see you shining. And I'm like, that's also my head around transform because I'm, t I'm often very good at being the thing behind the thing without taking any credit. But I'm like the thing behind the thing, the thing behind the thing. I, it's people often, yeah, I didn't know you were, well, you're part of that. Cause I didn't know you did that. It's constantly people saying that to me and I'm like, okay, Colette, it's, that's not the compliment you once thought it was. You need to you need to now lean into that fact and kind of maybe start owning your stuff a little bit. Why is it that you've been the thin behind the thin, the person behind the person? You've been in the shadows, should I say? Why is that? <laughs> um, it is because of systemic racism. Uh, because I learned, I got, I learned the hard way. Uh, well, one, there's two things. Is that, um, and I, I, I don't. When I worked in advertising, I had to start disassociating myself from my ideas and some of my work so that it happened because it got to the stage and there were a couple of occasions where if I, if I, if, if people knew something was coming from me, they, it would be blocked or vetoed 
just and I was like I really want this to happen for my brands and and some stuff where you know you're like this will be really good for my career no matter what I don't necessarily need my name all over this and I got really used to that um and and that's so that's where I kind of I guess I learned that and then um Actually, and I said in advertising, it continues throughout my career, honestly, until I set up by my me. But, and it was one of those things, you know, when you say, you said about like these ingrained habits, you learn because for survival, you learn these ingrained habits. That was one of them for me. It was like, you can be the thing behind the thing because you can, you'll, you'll be able to have impact, which is a really important thing for me. Like not personal impact, but impact on the world around me. That's always been really important. So you can have it, this thing will have impact and you know it's you, don't need the word to know. And also, um, maybe the negatives about being very visible, like it's, you can do, with the being the thing behind the thing, there's a lot more freedom. For me, there's a lot more freedom. I can do what I want, I get to make decisions, but I don't necessarily have um, you don't have the same flack as if you're like at the front, like at the forefront, right? And knowing immediately and knowing instinctively that, you know, whether my bosses were, um, well, because it's all except for, this is right, I'm, I'm really hoping I don't erase somebody here. But everybody except for my first ever boss in advertising was a black woman, brilliant, and that was a really great start. My first two years of advertising were like, genuinely the best i i made a real big mistake in leaving that agency because it was really great um and i didn't i didn't quite i didn't have my criteria set up anyway so apart from my first boss was a black woman all of my other bosses that ever have been white and therefore you can go i can see that you are getting shit in your role for be you know as a boss it's going to be five billion times worse if I'm in that role as a black woman. I can see it. You know when you don't, I don't need to, because I can see, so this person, well, you you might be a woman, but I'm like, cool. But as a black woman, are you, because bear in mind, I'm already getting some of this crap deflected off you. I'm already getting it. I'm already getting it. And your, you know, your role should be shielding me. And it probably, it, it partly is shielding me from the, the full full brunt of it. And I'm already getting quite a lot of it. So it really made me not... Um, want to seek that out for a while and then when I did I was and I when I was looking for those kind of bold board roles you know the ones reporting to the CEO or on the leadership teams I was just told like I just I just hit all kinds of what was it ceilings cliffs all of them I hit them all and and then people would say, well, it's, well you've always, it's always because you've been the thing behind the thing, you weren't visible enough. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's one of those things, isn't it? You, you hit these kind of double-edged, um, no, contradictory stuff where you're like, yeah. exactly. we, do, don't you, do we don't like it when you're visible. You don't, you make it all about yourself. Cool, I won't be visible then. All oh, right, you're not visible enough to be a leader. Cool, which one is it? Both of those things, people, you get constant contradictory feedback. And I think, and I, you know, and I, now when I do like men's doing stuff, I always talk about this because it is a, is a thing. You always know, um, for, I, I feel like this is the case if you're from multiple minoritized communities, it's definitely the case for black women where you, and for, for many black women, some people don't experience it. That's okay. Our journeys are not the same, but genuinely there's a thing where you will get very contradictory feedback. And you'll be like, this doesn't really sound like me. And the people will offer you well-meaning advice. Oh, do this, do this. It'll be contradictory. And it's simply because people love to create words to explain things that are actually just born out of systemic racism or systemic oppression. They want to create words to show that it's not that. But in reality, this is why it's contradictory. because, Or it's just nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Because actually, that's not the thing. The thing is, mm, we don't want you. We don't want a black woman to be doing that role. Thank you. Or, and we, because, and it got to the stage where in my career, this was the sort of just before I set up, well, when I took the career break before setting up Brand White Me, I got to the, I got to the um, stage where I just, I couldn't see an option to move forward. Like anywhere I went in my career, I genuinely looked at it and I was like, I'm stumped because I've tried this, ain't worked. I've tried this, it hasn't worked. I've tried this, it hasn't worked tried this job, no, get told, and all this contradictory feedback, and I'm like, but hang on, and then you start to think, hmm, hang on a minute, this feedback isn't about me, this is about the system here, and I 
need to and then I was like do you know what I just need to take a minute let me take a career break because I need to I need to do some planning I need to think about this because it ain't going to be easy for me to think about my next step and with character the clarity of three weeks and a break I set up brand by me and I haven't looked back and that's where all the stuff and the you know all the stuff we've talked about oh I have the opportunity to be creative I am in a leadership role and I can absolutely step into my space as a leader and I can lead I can lead I can lead with our clients I can lead my team a team of all freelancers still we can we can lead we can build beautiful things together I can I don't you know I, I don't have to burn myself out to break down through systemic barriers I don't have to do that anymore I can set up everything on my own terms and that's kind of a beautiful thing it's not for everybody running a business but it certainly worked for me would you say you're a courageous person because when you took that career break and you made that decision you took your own savings and you backed yourself and there are times when people have been in those spaces they're at burnout and they can't see a way forward apart from just going back into the same old system you were very much like no nah, i don't want to do that i'm going to back myself and, and go forward for this so has courage always been like a, a character trait for you or were you just at that point where like i just can't do this anymore i need to do something different i think yes so both courage is a trait uh, not one i would ascribe to myself but people always say it like you're brave like there's all sorts of stories of me doing stuff and people are like that's brave and, and sometimes i say like, that's brave but i'm not i don't care and it, but it, for me also it's the it's the it's the fire thing because i'm like i get to a point and i'm like no nah, i can't see another option and it's burning i have to do something because i can't see another option here i have to do it and it's always the fire thing that's moved so but yeah, I think that the, um, I think both are true. So I think that I, there is a part of courage and a, and a, a, a thing of bravery around me. I think I, I do do that. I tend to, I, I definitely a hundred percent, I've always said it like, and I genuinely always endorse people to invest in yourself and back yourself. It's the best bet you can make. Like you put, just put, but put money on yourself. So when you're, thinking oh you know oh i need money to back just back yourself create just some space you need to back yourself like it's the best thing you can do and um yeah i think so i think yeah the, the courage is a part of it and then oh uh, yeah i think the, the other part is the fire thing so when i'm when my back is against the wall or i think i don't have options that's when the fire steps in and i'm like let me burn all this down and start again and that's what that's literally what happened i was like let me burn it down and start again then it's not a not a bad approach, you know. If it's not if it's not working, start again. And yeah. I think there's something I think around we need to agency. Sometimes. You do, yeah, yeah, you hundred percent do. Recognizing we have that agency, we have that choice. I think is something that people don't think we do. It's always like I, I don't have any other options. Like actually, you do. The choice is just a lot harder, or requires courage requires you to step outside your comfort zone requires you to do something different that's why it seems impossible that's why it doesn't come into you most people's mindsets but that choice is always there if you take if you're willing to step into that agency i i 100 percent agree with that i li it's fact i was um on a call with a um a consultant i'm partnering with and we're going to do some work with a client and literally i said those exact words because i observe it quite a lot like I'm not going to name the organisation, it would be really unfair, but I notice it quite a lot in the work I do. So let's talk about like anti-racism right at the moment. And and specifically, because I work with brands and brand folk, but and I look at it through a lens of brand strategy, but I talk about anti-racism and people, the A, so you get, you will be in a room of senior leaders and they're talking about they won't let us. Obviously not those childish words, but basically, let's, let me paraphrase for you. They won't let us or this and it's that lack of agency it is that it's the we're too scared so we'll just abdicate all of our agency and all of the power and when you're looking around you're going there was a time when I would have killed to be in a room like this not literally killed because I have integrity I'm not going to do that but I would have I would have done pretty much a lot of things to be in this room and you have immense, because of the impact you can have, and I know, and I'm looking at you, and I'm like, I'm looking around at the room going, you're not, why are you giving this up? Why are you giving up your own, why are you giving up your power so readily? And why are you just sort of stepping aside? Why are you not making the decision? Why are you not making the tough call? And 
you know when people say it, it's difficult well it's difficult and I'm like no do you know what there are people that have a difficult I don't get me wrong sorry I ain't gonna diminish anyone's struggle but I'm gonna suggest that if you are sitting around the boardroom discussing issues that impact minoritized folks on the daily that are life and death for people and you're sitting around the boardroom discussing them I might argue that this is this probably ain't your struggle and I'm gonna argue that because you're sitting around the boardroom discussing it maybe not being directly affected by it I'm gonna say that gives you some power and I and I might suggest that therefore what you're choosing to do is what you just said is abdicate your responsibility is step away from that is remove your agency for yourselves because of course there's always accountability we're accountable to we're always accountable to, 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 to people but that accountability extends to ourselves as well and I'm like and I sit around with leaders and I don't so I, I don't when and it's interesting I was just saying this there's an exercise I do quite often which is that where people start and they do they start to use very passive language the organ and they start to create this new identity the organization will never allow it and I'm like who won't allow it who won't I might and I might I'm like I might invite you to frame that in the, the first person or I might invite you to just rephrase that using the active voice and see how it sits what exactly are you saying right now and it's super interesting as an exercise to get people to think about agency and power. It's a little one. It's a really, it's a simple, just a, the simple reframe. Because it's really easy for us to say they won't let us. And ultimately, it's like, who, who's not letting you now? Who's they? Who's Let's they, talk yeah. about they. Who's they? <laughs> who's they? Who are you talking about? Who's they? Particularly, you know what? In the boardroom, I'm like, who's they? Who are you looking at? You're here. I'm like, you know, you might even be in the room with the CEO. Who are you talking about they for? Who's they? Trust me, I um, I was in fact I was in something last week, and we had to spend the whole day on this topic, and they're blaming the system. This is not right. This is not like, who's they? You're they. You're this. You're the group. This is not the group. This is not the group. Look at that T-shirt. This is not the group. You are scanty. So we're gonna spend time, and we're gonna delve into this until we get it, and we and it took time, but it's that human trait, isn't it? It is so easy just to, nah, this is not my problem, or this is this is someone else's doing, not recognizing that you can actually do something about it. And I think that actually got me curious, actually. When I think about you going into those environments, you having those conversations, you challenging um, around social justice, around equity and all that kind of stuff. I've heard you talk about, you talked about it at David's conference as well, how um, DI is not enough. Why is DI not enough? When, you, when I heard you say that, there was something in my <laughs> chest that just <laughs> smiled. I had this big, I'm sure David, David's a tester. So he just looked at me. I was smiling because we've had this conversation privately. And I'm like, oh, this is, I want to lock in and listen to this. Like, this is, this, is, this is not what people tend to say out there in the world. Especially at a time such as this where it feels like DI is under attack. But that's not what you're talking about. And I think it's something really, really powerful the way that you actually break it down. So I want to give you the floor around that. Like, why is DI not enough? Oh, thank you. Like, so, oh, there's so much here. I will start this by being super open and saying, and I did, as I did on that day at the Brave Leaders Conference and saying, this was a rec this was a growing, something that was sitting in the back of my head somewhere. And something, somewhere, honestly, that people some very, very good anti-racism practitioners had been saying for ages, DEI is not enough, DEI. And I was thinking, and I never, I wasn't, I just, it didn't sit with me. I was thinking, well, surely it's about, then I thought, no, nah, it's about how you do DEI. And I think there are many people in that space. It's not, no, it's not DEI is not enough. It's about how you do it. Some people are doing it tokenistically, but there is a way of doing DEI that you can deliver change and impact. And I'm like, in the short term, Yes, you probably can. The thing, unfortunately, that DEI... So I, I shared it, like, at the Blame Leaders, I said there's this quote. Um, I actually shared it again on LinkedIn this morning. Like, about, like, ten people liked it. I was really sad, but anyway. Um, 
It was um, the uh, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house by order of lord quote and i said and this is this is why dei fundamentally doesn't work because dei was born out of and is is comes from the same oppressive corporate structures that are upholding systems of oppression within organizations within companies DEI comes from DEI and, and of course it's evolved. So the D and I was first and then they added the E to it. But you can't just add a letter and say now it's going to fix equity. Like people did, like people literally did that without changing anything else. Just adding the letter, doing exactly the same. They have literally their same strategy. Just um, what's the word like, you know, you know, when you do um, uh, the find and replace Mm-hmm. So they where they'd written D, D D and I, they just went through find and replace D E I. You didn't yeah, actually they change the as well. So you got Jedi as well. Yeah, and Jedi as well, and and Jedi, but it's all the same. You've even got um, what's another one? You've got yeah, you've got one with the A for anti racism in there. But fundamentally, it's all based in the same thing, which is, and it was because it's developed. It's a bit like the so it's the master's tools, right? So it's like the master's house is systems of oppression and and corporate structures that uphold systems of oppression. DEI is a tool, but because it comes from the master, the master's never going to let you destroy his house with his own tools. It's not. It's just not going to work. So actually, you need to create... There were, there were, there were deliberately new... There are deliberately social justice, anti-oppressive tools. There's anti-racism work. There's anti-oppression work. There are some specific things born out of movements t- designed to deliver justice. Those things you can take, like we do, anti-racism, you can take anti-racism into an organisation and you can do anti-racism work in an organisation and that will deliver systemic change. DEI ain't that. DEI was created of and for corporate and, and for corporate, it was created for. To D, D, add some diversity in. B, make people feel like they're included, even though they're not because the system is rigged and it's still the same system. Oh, we'll add the other letters so people think we're doing the work without changing anything. So um, that's a much less articulate way that I said it before. But it's basically that that DEI. So what DEI does, it because it replicates and wants to work within the system, it's what we said before, isn't it? Sometimes you need to burn the thing down and start again. You just need to burn it all down. And that's okay. You just need to start again. And DEI just doesn't allow you to do that. It is it it and that's why because so for example DEI teams were reporting into HR then they weren't reporting into HR but then what happened when there's downsizing they like oh no it makes sense to put it back into HR you can't put DEI in HR because HR is about um, making the most of people for the use of an organization literally human resources there's a reason you can change it people it's still the same department human resources the resources that are to be used to make this um, organisation, company, money, no matter what. So actually, if you put DEI into there, why are we then doing our diversity, equity, inclusion work? So that we can get more from people, so that we can extract more from them. It is not about liberation or justice. And so, and then, sorry, and then I'm going to stop in a sec, but the other thing about DEI is often it's an enacted by people who... No, it is so steeped in the system's oppression. So DEI, so it, it, it cancels out anti-racism work because DEI often upholds white supremacy. It prioritises white comfort. It has to, because it's about working within the system. It's about everybody feeling included. That's not what inclusion is. It was about making sure that we create the structures, systems and circumstances so that previously marginalised groups can be welcomed into our organisations. DEI co-opted. All of a sudden, everyone needs to feel included. Everyone, diversity is about diversity of thought. No, it isn't. These sort of things. So, of course, it, and, and it constantly happens because actually, at the so you, how do I say this? At one point, you can go, yeah, okay, you can come back to the argument, which is, it's just people doing DEI wrong. But I go, if something can so often and so readily 
and so consistently be co-opted by oppressive structures and systems. It ain't the way you're using the thing that's wrong. It's probably the thing itself. Mm. And that's kind of where I got to with DEI. Mm. I like came with a whole word today. (laughs) (laughs) Then every single thing that you said makes perfect sense. So how do organizations and cultures then begin to actually make a change? Because that, for me, goes back to the point you made earlier on around effectively burning down the whole system and starting again, in a sense. But this is more around burning down the whole system and how you're thinking about how you're bringing inclusion and how you're tackling equity and how you're doing it in your business. It is a whole new way of a new, whole new radical way of thinking about it so therefore that requires organizations to be able to stop step away from autopilot and do something different at a time when the arrows are getting cut budgets are getting slashed we're seeing the backlash from judge floyd's murder playing out in in society and playing out in culture what do organizations do then Oh, where do I start? I think, okay, so there's a couple of things that DEI work has been really helpful. One, your DEI work likely, because it will have given you a sense of maybe some of the issues that you need to tackle, even if DEI is not the solution. So, for example, I mean, God, let's take anti-racism, for example, in and around... 2020, if not before, I mean, we'd hope before, but certainly 2020, there was a whole lot of listening done around how racism shows up in the organisation. There's been a whole lot of work done. Some of it, if you're, if you've got a diversity, equity, inclusion strategy, it's likely that you've started collecting data on who is in your organisation and their experiences. It's likely that you're starting to understand stuff like what your pay gaps are and things. So you've got at least some of the information. It's not like we're starting, you know, when we go, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Well, I'm going to go if your DEI strategy has been even remotely serious, you've had resource around it, you're going to have collected a lot of information because honestly, where um, DEI folks, often DEI folks like to start with the data and I don't, I'm not knocking that at all. It's just sometimes when you're in large and complex organisations, you can get so caught up in that sort of data collection, listening point that you don't move into any, you don't move into anything else. You don't necessarily learn from it. You don't collect the learnings. You also don't, there's not, there's not also collective learning. So what we might do is go, and this is where at a sector level, it's super useful to go, okay, we have this information. This is what's going on in our organisations. You might suggest that you come together as groups of organisation with a sector and go, what's happening for teams? Now that collaboration in corporate is really not thought about, but it is useful because actually your DEI is not a proprietary IP. It's not intellectual property, right? It's something, it's about creating an experience for people. So you might, you have some data as a sector about what's going on. That's a useful starting place. You might then, (laughs) radical, but you might then pay people who are, multiply minoritized. So what I mean by that, it's no point just getting in any old ex-black person just because they're black to go and tell you about anti-racism. No, but you can speak to anti-racism experts, particularly if those people are from other minoritized communities. So for example, if they're doing anti-racism work linked to social mobility, for example, stuff like that, because where people are dealing with multiple systems of oppression, you're going to know that people are having an intense experience. And then if you, if you kind of design for and fix that, it will then work for people that are maybe experiencing just one of the oppressions. So that's where we might go. You might also look to movements. So there's been a whole lot of work. So for example, um, I'll take the example of um, hmm, law enforcement, right? There's been a lot of work done about what needs to happen differently with law enforcement. There's a lot of policy out there written by really good think tanks. You might start looking at that. You might start looking at that. There's a whole lot of brilliant work that's been done looking at the role of organisational structure and how that can replicate systems of oppression. You might just start looking at that and trying and testing some things. But where you're looking to is not from the safety of DEI. You look to the radical movements for change. You look to people, the minor, you know, things led by and for minoritized communities. You 
you kind of, you do your listening, but you also listen to actually understand, not just listen on this repeat loop. So people are having to rehearse and regurgitate trauma. Um, you <laughs> continue, you, you maybe <laughs> don't decimate the team that has been working for all these years to gather the data. You might though, give them some accountability. You might partner them with external, really, really great people that sit outside your organisations that have a strong practice. You might, again, look to movements. These are some things you can do. You might also give yourself some ac accountability and stop using euphemisms. So rather than saying DEI, you would talk about anti-racism and anti-ableism and um, you might talk about, um, you know, tackling uh, transphobia or cissexism. You might talk about really tackling, you know, you might talk about tackling patriarchy, not just tackling gender bias because it's softer and more palatable. You might actually start talking about these things. And so, and I mean, that's where I'd say, like, it sounds super wishy wishy, but there's, I don't know where to start because there's just so much out there that you can use for your organization. We do it at Brown Me, I'm like, okay when we're looking at how to, like, equitable structures, I'll speak to my team about, okay, so what are the things, like, we had this, I, I remember speaking to one of my colleagues, and, and um, I don't think he'll mind me sharing this as a story. So um, one of my colleagues, um, Suleiman, is um, a disabled um, a South Asian man. And we, when we first did our first project together, it was for a client, and we were doing anti-racism and anti-ableism together. And I brought him in as a consultant because I was like, look, I can do the anti-racism stuff, but anti-ableism, I'm not even going to speak to that. Why would I? That's going to, that would be horrendous. In fact, I actually almost turned down the brief. I was like, you know what? I saw anti-ableism and thought, I can't do it. Then I thought, no, well, you know what, Colette? I then met Suleiman and was like, oh, I can do it if I work with him. So we worked together collaboratively. And I remember we were on um, Zoom and um, we were on Zoom and Suleiman, I'm not actually going to share the full story. I've realised this spoke. So I was on Zoom and Suleiman was like, oh, it was the equivalent of, should I, you know, we're going to be on a Zoom with the client. Should I show up in a certain way, present myself in a certain way? Should I, you know, make sure that I'm, you know, sitting in my wheelchair or as I normally do, do I, I prefer to, you know, normally when I'm at home, I prefer to lie down. I was like, well, how do you, how are you going to be most comfortable running a workshop? And he said, well, honestly, I'm going to be more comfortable if I lie down. I was like, well, it's Zoom. Like people do their Zooms from their bed. You do what you need to do. You can show up in your most comfortable way. Just by asking the question, how, was, how do you feel more comfortable? We were able to create a work, working environment, which means that actually for our clients, we, we set the expectation. So then when we were doing stakeholder interviews with fellow, with, with disabled folks, with other disabled folks across the industry, people were, saw Suleiman, you know, lying and just, you know, co co um, hosting the workshop and were like, wow. I mean, I ne it never, I would never have thought that I could, do anything but be in my wheelchair, which, you know, for some wheelchair users is super fatiguing over time. And it's just this example of like, ask the question, ask the question what's needed and then create the conditions so that actually people can do the work. And that's what we did. Really small example, but that's what, that's kind of what needs to happen. Ask the question what's needed here and then create the conditions so that people can actually come in there because there are some super smart people that, you know, there are so many, we have now, we have a lot of the ways forward. I'm not going to say the answers because it's not like, that's too simplistic. It's not one answer. Yes, the answer to racism is no. There is, but there's, there's a number of ways forward and interventions and ways of showing up that are conducive to anti-racism work. And there are equally some stuff that just works against it. And that understanding is widely out there. You don't even sometimes, it, like, that some of the basics you don't even need to pay for at this point. So, and when I say don't need to pay for, I don't, I don't recommend you don't pay people. What I mean is, it's all in the public domain. So start with what's in the public domain or start with what you collectively learn from books and then build from there. I'm going to stop now. If you wanted an example of what it's like to work with Colette and bring someone into unlock the power of your brand you can see how strategically that she thinks you see how collectively that she thinks you can see how creatively that she thinks 
And for me, it's it's a joy to hear that because I think there are so many times when people we talk about representation all the time, but even in the work that we do, you don't see a lot of it sometimes. And being able to see yourself, being able to have that example of like Solomon didn't, like he said, have the conversation, ask the question. So many times people are thinking stuff, they wouldn't have the audacity or the courage to, do to ask the question in the first place. And it's not making them feel good. So even having that, like, no, let's let's ask the question. Let's find out what's what's in there. And this is how we're going to set up. This is how we're going to go. And we're going to, it's such a small little things can make a huge difference to other people and can really begin to build and break down the system. But it starts by leaning into curiosity. It starts by being bold, by being courageous, by doing a lot of things that you've just demonstrated in your approach, which I've loved in this conversation. So thank you for that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And um, no fast coming to the end of today. So how do you define leadership? Would my last question I'll leave you with. Mm. Leadership for me is about having a really clear vision for not just yourself or the thing you're doing in an in isolation, but maybe how that fits in to the wider world in a way that makes our world slightly better than it did without the thing, if that makes sense. And then being able to engage people in that vision consistently and coherently enough for it to start being realised. I'm going to flow from that question. I said my last question. I'm going to leave it to a different one, which says, if I'm an organisation listening to you talk, and I'm starting to realise that I want to do things differently, how do I know I'm the right client for Colette to work with? There are a few things you need to be serious about social justice so if you're doing this to tick a box or ah oh, because god well we have to everyone else is doing it or because yeah yikes we think we might sell more stuff to you know a specific minority group please don't come and approach us that's not for us but if you are actually and, it, and when i say serious about justice you don't have to be a charity like there are many commercial organizations that equally are passionate about social justice like ben and jerry's being one of them consistently even now owned by unilever like they actually sued unilever like they sued unilever when unilever started to take a different a direction that they were like is oppressive they were like no we're going to sue you so um i'd say yes if you're serious about justice and equity and you want to start getting specific about tackling this stuff in your organisation, but more importantly, in a way that drives who you are, what you stand for and how you do things in the outside world. Because that's kind of where we come in. We, um, so we are looking to work. Yeah, that's that's how, that's what I'd say. If you're serious about organisation, uh, sorry, serious about social justice and you're an organisation that's not just wanting to do internal stuff, but also think about how it affects how you show up in the outside world too. Um you want you need to be willing to invest time and money and other resources in it and you need to recognize that this is not going to be just a one-off project and if all things if all, all those things are true or even maybe if two out of the three are true have a conversation and then we can probably look at what we need to do to to make the third one true too I mean, I would say, sorry, the one, that, if, you, if you're not serious about social justice, do not have the conversation, no point. The conversation will be very short with us. It might be a, well, I, don't, I don't think we can work with you, and it might be, well, no, even then have the conversation, because you know what, we won't be a brand by me working with you, but I can probably refer you to somebody that there's some really good organisations that are, are maybe, maybe working with organisations that are... Um, maybe doing this 
for different reasons so that they can still have an impact. But we are serious about social justice. That's my move. How can people find out more about you if they do fill that criteria and want to, and want to have a conversation? What's the best place for that? Ooh, this is really great. Um, so uh, I would say, actually, there's two two things you can do. You can um, connect with me um, on LinkedIn. I'm at Brand by Colette. Sorry, not at, but I'm backslash in backslash Brand by Colette. Um, you can follow Brand by Me on socials. So at Brand by Me HQ on Instagram and just company slash Brand by Me on uh, LinkedIn. And um, you can you can also visit our website, um, brandbyme.co.uk or colletphilip.com, my own website, either one of those. They both have contact us uh, mechanisms. Uh, I will say, uh, spoiler alert, that Brand by Me website is going to go undergo some significant change shortly, um, which is very exciting uh, and very needed. Uh, so which is why I've said them in that hierarchy. Normally I'd be website first, but I'm like something really good's coming. So I I might wanna you I might send you to LinkedIn so you can know when that's gonna come. Indeed, I look forward to seeing that. Well, you've heard it here. You know how to get hold of Colette and her wonderful, amazing organization. And all those details will definitely be available in the show notes as well. If you just want to click and go through that. Well, thank you very much for this conversation, Colette. It has been it's been refreshing. I have enjoyed it. Honestly, I looked at the time, I was like, wow, we've, we've gone way off. So, <laughs> <laughs> been like, there's so many ways to look over this conversation in lanes, but it's been it's been great. So thank you very, very much for coming Thank on. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. This is Everyday Leadership. We will see you all next week. Thank you.